Welcome to another Unwinding with Fiber and Fabric. I am so looking forward to sharing with you some finished objects and one work in progress. My theme, I guess you could say, for this episode is using my hand spun in sample projects that just so happen to be doll sized or baby sized. One of the things that um, I like to be able to do is I like to test out a new technique or test out a new idea uh, of something I want to do. Even, even if it is a pattern that I'm using or trying to follow that somebody else has, has written, I like to test out new techniques and new concepts in smaller baby size or doll size. So I'm going to be sharing a bunch of those with you and I'm going to be sharing some really special and dear to me, very old dolls and some of my very first knitting from <laughs> decades ago. But before I do that, I have two things I want to, to share. One, if you're not aware of it, um, most of my videos, I try to add chapter marks. They are in the description below and they will help you speed ahead or rewind to specific areas of my videos. When it is appropriate, I put these chapter marks in. And um, of course, I want you to watch the whole video, but this will help you if you would want to go back or you need to, to jump ahead. These will help you, these chapter marks will help you find those locations. And as I said, I would love for you to watch all the way to the end and hit like and subscribe if you choose to do so. But I do want to make it as user friendly as possible for you because I know that since I cover so many different types of crafts at times, I want to have you find what you're looking for if you've come here looking for something very specific. So the second thing that I want to cover before I get into my sample trial slash doll baby knits is I want to show you my um, two projects that I have completed or <laughs> nearly completed. The first one is a machine embroidery hello. It was a design that the design I, I, I picked up from embroidery library. It is a stack of books. It is um, something I was we were going my daughter and I were talking about doing for a gift that we were going to give but time constraints and different things kind of forced us into doing a different project. But this was already cut out and ready to stitch. So I figured I'd go ahead and do it and give it to my daughter. Um, as you can see, I have hand quilted the front of the pillow. It's a simple envelope closure in the back and it is ready for her well, it's almost ready for her to love. It hasn't been washed and I do like to wash um, my hand quilt quilted items. It makes it all crinkle up a little bit, but this fit on the pillow quite well. So it may not get washed just yet. We'll wait until a cat has lived on it for a while and then we'll wash it. And then the other project, if you go back um, to my knitted projects in Vlogmas, you will know I made a cowl and a hat out of this yarn. And I now have the coordinating gauntlets that I just need to get all the ends <laughs> woven in. I need to get them in the mail because these match the ones that the, the hat and the cowl that I made for my son. He um, has been enjoying having those. What I explained to him is that the hat and the cowl were made to be for chilly weather, not cold weather. Same kind of thing for this. This is meant to be just something specifically when he's sitting at the computer working. Um, sometimes his apartment gets a little chilled and this works. Now I made them with my husband's hands as my model and I still have yet to get, well, cause I don't have the ends woven in. I've been busy doing some home <laughs> improvement projects with my husband and working on, um, one of the test knits that I'll show you in a minute. And I keep forgetting to, to weave in the ends, but I got to get the ends woven in, put them in the mail, get them off to my son while it's still chilly this, this um, season. But one of the things I did when I tested them on my husband who has wider hands and a little bit longer hands um, is I did a uh, 
a, a set of ribbing here to have it narrow in at the wrist. They may be slightly too long, not quite sure. My, my son has long fingers like me and um, larger hands like my husband. So maybe, just maybe, these will be the right size. But if not, he can always roll back the ribbing at the top and there you have it. So I will be putting um, photos of these things. You can find them on my Instagram um, page if you're on Instagram. I am going to try to put the knitted items <laughs> in my Ravelry so that you can see them there. I also have a Facebook page that I try to post all these pictures as well. So if you're on these other social media and you want to see these on hands that they fit, there should be pictures eventually <laughs> showing up in one of those locations. On Ravelry, you can find me as Pioneer Lady. Um, on Instagram, I'm Pioneer Lady at Pithy Ponderings. And on Facebook, you can find me at Pioneer Lady at Pithy Ponderings as well, uh, as well as PithyPondering.com. I do update all of the different places in a regular or semi-regular fashion, especially when I have videos go out. So my second pair I've ever made, um, gauntlets, I'm pretty pleased. Oh, and I did find the paperwork. The yarn that I was using for these projects are a blend of Yak Down and Australian Merino wool. I couldn't remember what was blended with the yak, but that is what it is. Um, yak down in Australia, uh, Marina wool, 50, 50%. Oh, soft. It's called the Queensland collection. And I picked it up at um, my local um, yarn store back in the late summer, early fall. Love this stuff. Um, it came in, I bought 300 gram balls. I still have enough that I could probably make socks <laughs> or something of the, the 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 like if I, I i made these because the colors of these really um are colors my son likes and they the one really matches quite well with a jacket that he has so i made these with cool weather in mind not cold icy weather in mind something to just help take the chill off if i were making this to um be more for really cold I would have constructed the hat that I made for him slightly differently and the same thing with the cowl I may have doubled up the yarn um, if you know and get a thicker um, definitely a tighter uh, um, finished object that I did so I wanted to share those with you for those that had been seeing the hat and the cowl back in the back in December and that is my finished objects that fall in the category of kind of other than the main topic. So on to the main topic of today. One of the things I love to do is learn to do samples, but do samples on baby slash doll size. And a number of years ago, um, I went in search of dolls that had been previously loved that were in similar size to something, basically a doll that could technically wear a newborn baby outfit. And this little doll, she's wearing newborn pants that I purchased and a newborn um, turtleneck to help fill everything out. So the sweater does is newborn size, but the truth is that I'm not quite sure that the opening of the neck is um, is quite the right size. And that's one of the things that when I started on this latest project that I'll be sharing, that's one of the things that, that kind of frustrated me. I can find dolls that I can put newborn clothing on, but their heads and their necks aren't necessarily the right size and their feet aren't necessarily the right size. So if I'm trying to knit up and do samples and do photos, and um, just try out different patterns. The dolls I had <laughs> were close, but not quite. And so this past week, oh, and I should say before I put her down, um, this is something I shared on Ravelry a number of years ago. It is a hand spun. It is another wonderful example of how 
knitting with hand spun, the knitting really um, is kind to an uneven spin. This spin had some issues. It had some thick areas and thin areas, not thick and thin spinning, but it's a textured yarn. There were um, fluffy areas in the, the wool. There were neps. Um, so it's not an even spin. It's, it definitely is not something that looks like commercial yarn. And it, it turned out really lovely. And it was me just doodling. This, this whole thing is me just doing a top-down raglan, adding on a hood, trying to figure out how to make the construction of the hood, <laughs> and doodling with what is, I guess, lace, knitted lace. This is prior to me trying to sit down and really read a pattern. It is just doodle. It is, it is just play with it as I go. I love it. I love the combination of it. And she models it quite well. And it, it really works for her because she has um, a replacement wig. And eventually I would like to go through and re-attach um, hair. But that will be another day. For now, this, this is just the perfect outfit for this doll. So, she lives a lot in it. I'd like to make some more clothes for her. I'll talk about that here in a bit. But for now, I want to show you the project that started me back into <sighs> some doll focus. So this outfit, this is some yarn that I spun up back in 2016. And I spun it during the very first days of March when a big snowstorm, big blizzard had blown in. We were out, out of power about 36 hours. And during that time, sorry, as I adjust the pillow behind my back, so I'm a little more comfortable, as we waited for power to return, I spent a bunch of the time spinning. I had my Kromsky Minstrel in my front room in, back in my Colorado house. There was light coming in through the windows. I had a gas uh, or an oil, an oil lamp burning next to me as it started getting darker. And I was able to spin this fiber slowly and relax uh, in a relaxed fashion to an old oil style lamp and just the fading light. Um, it was a way for me to keep focused, keep calm and get in, in a way a bit to keep warm. So, I love this yarn. It strangely enough has really fond memories for me because I was unusually calm during that blizzard because I was spinning and oftentimes the high winds would make me um, anxious. It's not comfortable to be without heat. That house did not have a fireplace. There was no other heating option. So for 36 hours without heat, I am um, I, I spun when there was light and then I slept when there wasn't light. And so I wanted to knit, I want, I've been wanting to knit with this. I've been wanting to use this, um, this fiber for quite a while. And the skein of it and everything is, um, on my Ravelry. And I will be posting pictures of this little outfit on Ravelry because this unfinished hat is going to be probably my first Ravelenic Winter Games uh, finished uh, work in progress for work in progress dancing, which is one of the events of Ravelenic. Um, <laughs> and so I'll probably be posting that sometime after this, possibly after this video posts. But so I had these other dolls, but when it came time to knit, to knit this, I started knitting this. It is a top-down yoke. As I said, it's one of the techniques I wanted to try. I want to try the top-down yoke. Um, I've been thinking of doing a top-down raglan for the yarn that I'm um, spinning in the last um, video. I'm spinning it for my daughter to make a sweater for her. She has done this yoke type um, sweater herself, and she's done a poncho with it. But I've never done the yoke pattern myself. So I started thinking that 
it could be really nice to try that. So I wanted to do it on a baby size. And so I started knitting this um, uh, two weeks ago. The problem is that when I was trying it on my other dolls, I kept running into the issue of I, I didn't know how big to make the neckline or to make the neck opening. And even when I would go to other patterns, I looked up other patterns, looked up other baby patterns. It was really confusing for me because figuring out first how many to cast on if I was using a similar yarn to what they suggest, figuring out the measurement that I needed and figuring out how much their neck was based on ease. And that's the thing. So for babies, anyone who's had to dress babies knows you kind of need a much larger neck opening than the neck itself needs because it's got to go over the head. Babies' heads have a tendency to be much larger in proportion to their bodies than, say, ours. So I knew that I needed to have an opening. I needed to have a way to have the neck be up and closed. That's what I wanted is an up and closed, not an open boat style. And so I knew all of this. And so I was like, okay, how do I do this? Not that this has anything to do with the large sweater that I'll be making, but I want it to work for the dolls. And so, and I want it to work possibly for a baby because I love this yarn. And why wouldn't I want this to fit a baby if I'm making a baby sweater? So I started doing about a bunch of research. I looked at a number of patterns. I got very confused. <laughs> I found a chart that actually shows the measurements of real babies. <laughs> and what I discovered is what I suspected. A real baby's neck is much narrower, much smaller in circumference than the sweater patterns that I was finding. And since I was going to have a slit opening, which makes it so it will fit over a large baby head, I needed to have an idea of how close my knitted opening, how close in size. And while <laughs> this would fit over a doll, would it fit over a baby? So long story short, <laughs> I decided in the end I needed to buy a new doll and I found this doll and I'll put this doll's information in the description below for anybody who is interested in buying something similar to this because when it arrived I couldn't have been more happy yes I probably needed to do a couple more sets of stitches here at the neckline for the best ease will this work yes this will because of the opening. I had thought about actually maybe having a little snap at the top, but I decided that instead of having this in the back, I was going to have this in the front and it would be a design detail. You can see how I combined the opening by putting it in the round. I did some detail stitches, just little um, uh, garter stitch there. You can see on the back, it shows how I did my increases. It showed me that in doing this kind of yoke for me, for my comfort, rather than counting all the time, I'm going to put in stitch markers and just put my increase at each stitch marker as I need it. There's a lot of different patterns out there. Um, I was delighted with a number of the ones that I found, but in the end, I like to be able to keep it as simple as possible for my brain. And so for me, putting in markers and having the increases um, at each marker, that's going to work better. So this sweater started teaching me a great deal. One of the things that it also taught me, and, and I found this quite fascinating, um, is that I was using a circular needle, the same needle that I'm using on the hat right now. Um, and for those of you who might be interested, for the purpose of having it on the doll, I went ahead and pulled it tight, but I am using the magic loop. And I will share a little video of me knitting on this hat, um, using the magic loop. And it's so funny, I always have to remind myself, this is magic loop. 
not magic circle. Magic circle is what I do in crochet. Magic loop is using the cable needle, long cable needle and knitting and around. And there's some great videos if you haven't tried it. I really recommend it, especially to people, for people who have um, issues with their hands. I never drop stitches compared to if I'm using double pointed needles. So that brings me to um, my point. So I made this sweater, the body of this sweater using this magic, magic loop technique. But when it came to the arms, while I could have used that technique, I felt using double pointed needles, DPNs would actually work better. But I discovered something, and I think I've discovered this once before, even in making an adult size, but it was extremely noticeable when doing this small in the round um, sleeve. As I got about an inch into this sweater, and I know it, or this sleeve, I know it was this sleeve versus this, because if you notice, there's a white band here, and this side has more of a pink band. Um, although I think the pink band shows up more on the back. <laughs> but when I got to working on this sleeve, I got about an inch of the sleeve worked and I realized it was compressed. I was using the same size needle that I had used with the circular, but when I was using the DPNs, I use a wood DPN because the aluminum just slipped through the yarn, slipped through my hands fall on the ground a lot with the way my hands are these days. So when I was knitting with the wooden DPNs using the same millimeter size needle, the sleeve was squished in. It was shrunken in size. My gauge was tighter. My gauge was much tighter than it had been when I was knitting with the circular needles. So I ripped back the, and unfortunately I left um, my little safety yarn um, in place. So I ripped back to the beginning of the sleeve and I increased, these are a 3.25 millimeter needle and I went to a 3.75 millimeter wood DPN and I was able to get a uh, uh, an even gauge adjustment. So using a larger needle, but because my tension was tighter, the transition is seamless. So that's a tip, especially for people who do have issues with gauge, with their hands having issue with holding the needles. I've moved to using almost exclusively a circular needle. But when I need a DPN that is for small little areas like this, I will use a very short wooden DPN needle, but I need to remember to go up a size in, in doing the sleeve. I do that all the time when I go from ribbing, like in a hat, from ribbing up to just regular stocking net. I will go up a size of needle or up two sizes of needle, depending on what I'm doing. But I had not realized until I did this sweater, how much I needed to do that from going with the body on a circular down to um, a sleeve. With the hat, just a quick note on the hat, I'm already in the decreasing. It is a four by four rib. Um, I'm really enjoying doing a four by four rib. It, um, you can get it to actually, you know, shrink in depending on how the yarn works. But I like, I've been enjoying a four by four rib. It's just been, it's been fun. It's a little relaxing for me. And so I've been doing that. I did a loose four by four rib. Once I got past the brim, I did a increase row. In this case, I increased every, after every fourth stitch. And once I get up to the crown, I start my decreases. And in this case, I just, I had 80 stitches on the needle. I went ahead and put um, a marker at every, after every 16 and I'm doing an increase, or I mean, I'm doing a decrease before and after each marker 
every other round should have it done. So, oh, one more thing with this doll before I move on to the other dolls I want to share. One of the things I love, these are baby booties that were made by my mom. These are some of her baby booties and they're very pastel and very, very light, but, and they're some of the last ones that she made. This doll worked really well. It's foot and ankle are quite chunky while it's not as long as um, some baby's feet might be. It certainly has the heft of a baby foot and it works really well for baby booties. So I am really quite pleased with my doll. I do have to I have to make just the side note. <laughs> when I decided to, when I found this doll online, when I decided I was going to purchase this doll, I decided to check with the family to see what they thought. <laughs> and my husband groaned <laughs> um, and said, as long as the doll wasn't creepy and didn't freak him out, he was fine with it. <laughs> my husband's not as much of a fan of dolls as as I am. <laughs> but my one of my my son mentioned to me, he said, Mom, if it helps you do what you want to do, then it is worth the cost and it is worth the space that it takes up if it does what you want it to do. And this one does. Um, this one, this one actually will, I have a couple now that actually will suck their thumb. <laughs> Whoops, it pops out. Um, it does do what I need it to do. Uh, it, it, it really works. So I'm really glad it's an early birthday present to myself. Yes. And that's where I'm moving on to next. I have a birthday this month. <laughs> And let's just say we're over the 50 mark, but I won't say where. <laughs> and someone else has a birthday this month. My Winnie the Pooh that was given to me by my parents the day when I was born. It was my baby um, toy. And this one is one that was that. It's as old as I am. <laughs> and it was, my mom had, um, my mom had taken a class on children's literature and had just fallen in love with um, A. A. Milne's um, poems and Winnie the Pooh. And so um, this was the doll she bought me for, you know, for celebrating, I guess, my arrival. So he is the same age as I am. He is some worse for wear. I don't know why I put spots on him, but he is wearing knitted pants and a top that I knit when I was somewhere between the age of 10 and 12. Those were the years I was making knitted outfits for all of my stuffed animals. So here is my 50 plus year old Winnie the Pooh wearing 40 plus year old outfit that I knit. And I didn't like doing um, ribbing, so he doesn't have much ribbing. And the elastic that I put to help hold his pants up has become extremely old and no longer has any elasticity. But he has he has a sister because the next Winnie the Pooh that I was given when I was only probably like five years old, <laughs> I decided it really looked like a girl. So my boy Winnie the Pooh, my girl Winnie the Pooh wearing an outfit that my grandmother made for Cabbage Patch dolls. Um, not the original Cabbage Patch dolls, the ones you could make yourselves back in the eighties. And so I had, um, I had a cousin who was making these Cabbage Patch dolls and my grandmother um, purchased one for each of us grandkids and, and made some clothes um, for it. And so my girl, Winnie the Pooh, has one of those outfits on. And then of course, 
I also have this Winnie the Pooh, which is the last one. Those of you that have watched other videos will know that I have a large Winnie the Pooh that shows off um, a hat that I made two Christmases ago that has um, LED lights in the hat. But this is the last one. I, I got my large Winnie the Pooh when I was eight years old. This one came along probably when I was about nine or ten years old. He has a music box inside of him, but the music box has frozen up and I'm not wanting to open him up to get the music box out just yet. But my mom knit this little outfit. <laughs> my mom knit this little outfit for him and and yeah and look at the little closure <laughs> on the back so these are my my love beloved stuffed animals i loved stuffed animals when i was when i was young i had barbies i did have a couple um vinyl dolls but I loved my stuffed animals. Stuffed animals were my thing. Um, something that, a strange little emotional thing that I that I developed is, I had my tonsils out when I was nine years old and um, my parents bought me a stuffed animal from the gift shop. And, um, and I, I, tend, I tended to get stuffed animals for my birthdays and, and different things, but when I was nine and they got me that stuffed animal when I was in the gift shop, it was kind of like, um, it, it, it kind of created a little comfort thing in my brain to where if I have to go to the hospital, if my kids had to go to the hospital, if my husband has to go to the hospital, it, it causes me anxiety. Of course, wouldn't it cause, it causes most people anxiety to have to have surgery to, to have these things. And strangely enough, um, I found myself, <laughs> I found myself buying stuffed animals for me. Didn't matter if it was my kid in the hospital or whatever. It was, I got a stuffed animal for me. My kids think it's delightful. They, they just chuckle because, um, fortunately, very fortunately, we didn't have many, um, major emergencies when they were growing up. And it was usually my daughter who did have a, you know, an emergency room trip. And as much as I love dolls, eh, she can take them or leave them. She had dolls that she, um, stuffed animals that she loved and that she slept with. Still, still has her stuffed animals, but she never really, never really played with dolls all that much. Um, and, and so she had no problem whatsoever with me buying <laughs> comfort stuffed animals that may gravitate to me more than her. Um, she, she laughs about it. She knows that it gives me, it gives me, um, comfort. It makes me feel a little less stressed. I had a doctor's appointment just, um, last or earlier this week. I did not, it, it caused me a lot of anxiety. I have white coat syndrome. So something that developed in my, um, I did, I did not have white coat syndrome until I was at, um, 30 years old. It was due to a spine injury and due to the undiagnosed um, uh, issues that I had at that time. And it took about 10 years for us to finally be able to identify what was going wrong. And so during that time, I really did develop some serious white coat syndrome. And so... Um, for me, going to just even a regular doctor's appointment can cause me a great deal of anxiety. And it was really funny because my husband and I had to go to the, the um, <laughs> home improvement store after he took me to my appointment and brought, was bringing me home from the appointment. And you can't really find a stuffed animal in the home improvement store. So as it turns out, though, I was able to find an animal-shaped LED light, uh, color changing lamp that came home with me and my daughter just started laughing and said, Oh, it's the stuffed animal of this doctor's appointment. So, uh, uh, normally doctor's appointments do not require the additional stuffed animal, but this week's did because of other things going on in my life. Even a doctor's appointment just was a little too much stress and it was causing me to have 
the anxiety and then the physical side effects that come with um, my various ailments. <laughs> so, <sighs> for my birthday, a new doll, <laughs> for the stress of the doctor's appointment, a light <laughs> that looks like a, a, a tiger. So, there you have it. That's my little quirk, my mechanism. But I wanted to end this... <laughs> I know this has probably been a strange video. I wanted to end this video with um, some observation and thought that thoughts on making clothes for dolls. I belong to a Facebook group that um, make that makes doll clothes, and somebody asked the question, "What do you all do with the doll clothes that you make?" Do you sell them? Do you give them away? What do you do with them? And one one person responded, and I love this response because I have seen this as a, a common um, a common practice that I really do value and appreciate. The person goes around to thrift stores and purchases pre loved um, dolls, and much like this doll, she buys pre-loved dolls and she refurbishes them. She makes clothing for them. And then she gives them away to charities um, who support children in need, children whose situation may be less um, comfortable than we as society would like them to be. So she reclaims used dolls, refurbishes them, and then makes clothing for the dolls so that the doll goes with her own little or his own little wardrobe off to a new person. We can do that with our hand knits. We can especially do that when we are trying to use up the practice skeins, a uh, sample skein, trying a new technique, trying a new skill, just trying to use up remnants. We can make clothes, put them on a simple stuffed animal, put them on a simple doll, and they can go to charities um, that specifically meet the needs of those who might need a tender hug. And so if you're looking for a way to make items, even if you're using your hand spun, sorry for going off, but even if you're using your hand spun, even if you're using your hand spun that isn't necessarily gonna go through a washing machine well, you, you can do the same, um, you can do the same part, um, process. I see a lot of quilters and I see a lot of knitters and I see a lot of um, people who sew, sewists, um, worried about where, where it's going to go, how they're going to use it. I don't need to wait around until I have grandkids or great grandkids. I can make these things because these things give me joy. These things give me a sense of calm and peace. I unwind as I'm making them. And rather than having them stack up in my home, rather than having huge stacks of scrap quilts or remnants, or, or I make them into something and I want to give them away. And I have in the past done that with my quilts. And it's something that may very well happen in the future with my doll clothes. The thing to remember is that, <laughs> yes, if we are giving a doll to a charity that they we know that they're going to need to throw it in the hot water and wash it then yes take the time make it out of um make it out of fibers that will be less likely to shrink but if you're making it and you know that you're making it for someone who may actually not wash it partially then make it out of your hand spun but most importantly If you make it and you make it with love and you make it with care and you give it away, 
you're giving that hug and you're giving that joy. And if it shrinks, it shrinks. And maybe that's the thing. Some, I mean, there's tons of spinning yarn. There's tons of spinning fiber that won't shrink up as much. That would work great on dull clothes that we may not want to necessarily put against our own skin. And so you can find fibers that don't shrink as much and try spinning those. You can pre-shrink. You can make it big and pre-shrink it down so that it's already felted. You, you can try a number of things. Remember the point of this is we're trying to unwind our, for ourselves. We're trying to give ourselves a sense of peace and a sense of joy. And there's not a sense of peace and not a sense of joy. Yes. If the stack of quilts is now, you know, reaching our height or the stack of baby clothes. So we get a little creative. We take that little extra time to think, how can I make this to where it can be loved and it can be used? And one of the things, one of the things that I love about having purchased this doll is reading the, co the, the comments and recommendations from two specific organizations that just really reminded me that there are so many other options out there than just making something to fit on a grandchild. And one of those options was for um, daycares, preschools, um, organizations that work with children. They talked about how the undressing and dressing of a doll really helps the child learn motor skills, learn inter learn skills. It's a skill building activity. Interacting with the doll, having a lot of different clothing for the doll, being able to have that, that play time is so valuable to our children. Boys and girls alike benefit from this interaction. And that brings me to the other group. And when you take the two groups together and you think about how society was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 2000 years ago. In our society, we used to have babies and elderly all around us. They weren't put aside somewhere. They weren't put they weren't segregated. Little children and the elderly were not segregated from the 10 year olds and the 20 year olds. Society had them all present and little children played with little, ch littler children. And a, the elderly helped care for the infants and the little children. And the second group I'm talking about there, these dolls, these dolls that fit very much in your arms, like a baby would can give extreme comfort and joy to our elderly patients who suffer from dementia, Alzheimer's and other ailments. They can give a sense of peace. They can give a sense of play. They can give a sense of connection. It pretend. But for the very young, and in some cases, the very old, that pretend, in some cases, even the person in between, like me, that pretend time can sometimes really be the calm in the storm, can really help them develop motor skills. In my case, it's helping me develop motor skills and making smaller knits. So, when you ask yourself, well, nobody wants my hand knit sweater. Nobody wants my handmade quilt. Nobody wants. That is not true. We just have to take the time to find the somebody. There are a lot of organizations out there that will help you find the somebody. So if making this gives you joy, old or young, if putting a layette of doll clothes together or baby clothes together gives you joy, please find an organization that will accept your efforts. Ask them 
what parameters they need you to meet as you knit them up. There are so many organizations looking for these kind of items, whether it be for the actual baby or whether it be for the substitute baby. These, these organizations exist. So that's my message to you. Somebody does want what you have to give. You just need to keep looking. You need to keep believing and you need to keep seeking the joy. So until I see you again, I hope you can unwind with some fiber and fabric. I hope you can find some peace and joy in your activities. And until then, we will see you very, very soon.